Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's live session on the National Impact Agenda Framework in Action, Three Approaches to Leading Change. Uh, the overarching goal of this session is to continue advancing the ideas that were elevated during the National Impact Agenda um, and to advocate for strategic change in the preservation field. Um, we really hoped to demonstrate that everyone plays an essential role in creating positive change in the field of historic preservation. And today we wanted to profile the experience of three amazing organizations. My name is Dee Gao, and I'm the Senior Director of Research and Development at the National Trust. And I'm here to moderate the session and introduce our three amazing panelists who are members of the first ever National Impact Agenda Leadership Cohort. Uh, but before I introduce them, I wanted to share a little bit of background and context on what the National Impact Agenda is um, and what the goals are of the leadership cohort. So um, as many of you may recall, we released the National Impact Agenda at the 2021 Pass Forward Conference. And since then, I think this has proven to be a valuable tool, particularly a strategic planning tool and a guiding framework for the national preservation movement. And um, the ideas in this framework were really a culmination of a year long engagement process that reached over 700 individuals connected to historic preservation in some way. And along um, over the course of the year, we spoke to grassroots organizations, big city planners, state historic preservation offices and other national organizations among many other affiliations. If we could go to the next slide. The seven goals that emerged out of this process um, from growing collaborative networks to a truer history were synthesized from the broad range of feedback that we heard. And these goals aspire to represent a steady state positive outcome for the preservation field. And um, we, we really wanted to elevate what we've heard most frequently across different groups from a wide range of perspectives and um, synthesized this list um, in a way that would be resonant and relevant across many sectors. So these goals and additional content associated with them are published on our website, um, which you can find a link to in the chat. Um, so you can explore this content a little bit further. I won't go into it too much today because I know each of our panelists will be talking about their own work um, and sharing a bit more about, about each of these goals and how they are linked to what they're currently focused on. So we kind of like to start off by taking a quick poll to see um, where all of you in this Zoom room um, are focusing your work in each of these areas. So in just a moment, um, a poll, a single question will pop up on your screen. And um, it, the question is, which of the seven goals speaks most directly to your preservation work right now? Feel free to choose as many as you like. And um, alternatively, if you see a goal or if you have a goal that you don't see reflected in these choices, feel free to enter it in the chat or if you aren't sure where it might live in this framework. We'll give a moment for the responses to come in. Okay, we've hit about majority. So I'm gonna share the results now. So it looks like there is, I mean, it looks like there's a lot of representation across each of the seven goals here. 57% um, of people in the room responded that they're really focused on engaging the public. 50% are focused on growing collaborative networks. 57% sorry, I'm reading these in real time and it seems like they're still shifting, um, are focused on an inclusive movement. So it's really great to see such broad representation across each of these focus areas. And what we've really learned through this process is these goals are not mutually exclusive. They're all very interconnected. And all of our, all of our panelists, I think, will also illustrate how interconnected many of these goals are to one another. 
So thank you for participating in that. Let's go to the next slide. To continue building on this work, um, we have convened the first leadership cohort to help participating organizations apply the national impact agenda to their work. Um, another goal is to help organizations use this framework, use the ideas within the framework to guide decision making on future programs to help build ca their case for why um, it's important to expand in a particular direction and to also share lessons learned to inspire others to lead change and preservation. And so we wanted to bring this cohort together to give people space to share best practices, as well as some of the challenges they're facing and innovations that they are um, that they are advancing in this in this way that is inevitably part of this work of leading change. So um, I think we've we've had our first meeting so far, and it's been a valuable experience to just be in fellowship with other organizations that are on similar paths that are advancing these shared goals. Ten esteemed organizations from across the country volunteered to join the leadership cohort. We have a statewide, we have local and national nonprofits, and we have groups from both the public and private sectors with broad geographic representation. So today, we asked three of these organizations to show us how um, their work is linked to this, um, to, to the National Impact Agenda. And... Um, as our panelists present their work today, um, please input any questions you have for them in the chat. We'll have a Q&A at the end of this session and give them the opportunity to respond directly to any questions you have. So please share them in the chat as we go. Our first speaker today, next slide, is Karen Newport. Kara is the Chief Executive Officer at Filoli, a National Trust um, historic site in Woodside, California. Hi, Kara. And under her leadership, the organization has flourished as a vibrant cultural center for the Bay Area community, serving over 400,000 visitors each year. Kara has an extensive history in working in leadership positions with a variety of cultural organizations, um, including public gardens across the country from Philadelphia and Charlotte. Um, and she will be followed by Hector J. Berdesia Hernandez. Hector is a conservator specializing in architecture and monuments and the founding director general of the Puerto Rico Conservation Restoration Society Center. And he is also an adjunct professor in preservation technology and historic building materials conservation at the Polytechnic University of Puerto Rico. And to round out the conversation, we have the Executive Director of Preservation Austin, Lindsay Darrington. Lindsay brings 15 years of preservation experience to her work at Preservation Austin, both as a professional and an advocate. Since becoming Executive Director in 2019, she has led the organization through its first strategic planning process in seven years and helped shape a new, more inclusive mission and vision to guide their work. Um, in the context of the rapidly changing city that is Austin, Texas. Um, she began her career with the nonprofit Landmarks Association of St. Louis in 2007 and has worked as a preservation consultant with projects from St. Louis to New Orleans. So please join me in welcoming all three of our panelists. And without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Kara to begin her presentation. Great, thanks. I'm gonna just take a second to share my screen here. Okay, um, thank you. And Dee, thanks, uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, and I was uh, thrilled to see the um, kind of the balance in everyone's interest in the impact agenda. I was so excited when I first learned about it because I think that it does provide us a, a wonderful common community developed framework um, to uh, to align with. And that's always, um, I think that's always really builds enthusiasm and, and can support the cause of um, uh, preservation and all the other causes that go with it. So I am going to um, talk about how Fidloli, uh, our organization is leading change. So to, to frame that, I just wanna give a quick background. Our mission is to connect our rich history with a vibrant future through beauty, nature, and shared stories. And I think those shared stories 
um, are really kind of the focus of what I'll be talking about today. And we envision a time when all people honor nature, value unique experiences, and appreciate beauty in everyday life. And I think, you know, for us, what has emerged since we developed our vision statement is that valuing unique experiences is the heart of, um, of a lot of, of the um, efforts that we're making around inclusion and welcoming and engagement. Um, and uh, appropriately, Philoli, uh, the name is Fight for a Just Cause, Love Your Fellow Man, and Live a Good Life, F-I-L-O-L-I. -L -L -I. So it comes from this wonderful motto, which was Mr. Bourne's credo, and I think is really appropriate for these times and these discussions. Um, we are 654 acres, uh, 16 acres of formal gardens, a uh, 54,000 square foot Georgian Revival house. We have a board of 25, 80 staff, an operating budget of over 10 million and 400,000 visitors. So um, we're a, a bigger organization in the preservation world, a mid-sized nonprofit in some of our other industries, um, and we cross a lot of different um, barriers. When we developed our strategic plan in um, 2019, uh, these were our cross-cutting principles, and I think they're really relevant to the impact agenda, diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, sustainability, and organizational excellence. Um, so what I'm going to do is just talk about a few ways that we intersect with the impact agenda. First of all, um, and really important to us is an inclusive movement. Um, we uh, began our efforts in 2019. We were part of the American Alliance of Museums Facing Change Initiative. And, um, and that was really focused on diversifying our board because in the museum world, 100%, uh, I'm sorry, more than 60% uh, of the boards were 100% white when they did their assessment. And Philoli's was um, very close to that statistic. So we really wanted to to change that. Um, and we wanted to change it in part to align with our existing demographics. Our regional demographics are very diverse and Philoli's visitation is very diverse. We're younger um, than, than folks might imagine with the majority or the, the central um, crux of our visitors are between the ages of 18 and 44 years old with families. Um, we are uh, very diverse in our representation, um, and we wanted to make sure that we um, were not only diverse in attendance, but we're, we were representing um, that diversity in our leadership and our board um, and our staff and in our programming. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and make sure that we're, we're not just diverse, but we're welcoming and inclusive and, um, and that we're uh, supporting equity among our, um, all of our audiences. Another national impact agenda item is growing collaborative networks, and this has been part of um, really for us the diversity and inclusion uh, discussion. We we recognize we couldn't do this alone, and um, and and for us it started it really actually started with marketing and um, and really in you know, investing in the communities that we wanted to invite to come. Um, and that started for us with uh, Chinese language radio and then really grew from there to um, many languages of advertising, um, uh, Spanish, um, uh, Chinese, Japanese, and, um, and, and different partners to go along with it. But probably one of our most critical partners is the Ramatish Ohlone Association. Um, they're the original pe peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. Prior um, to the arrival of the Spanish, they had numbered um, over 2,000 people. Um, but that, you know, Spanish, the Spanish colonials really decimated the, the coastal um, native uh, um, population. And so we only have a very small number of direct descendants um, that we know about um, that are engaged. But fortunately, we have Jonathan Cordero, who is um, the leader of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, and he's Philoli's indigenous advisor. He is a paid partner, and that's really important to us is to pay our partners for their work. Um, and he was really critical in helping us develop our land acknowledgement. So this is our um, entire land acknowledgement, but uh, the top portion is, is the public portion that we talk about the Lamchin tribe that was the tribe that was actually physically on the Philoli property. Um, it was a, there was a village site here and the Ramatish Ohlone people who were in this region. Um, and um, 
And then we we also had um, go on to say that we are talking about the impacts of colonialization and then the adverse um, effect that it had on the indigenous peoples um, and the, in those injustices and, and what we're doing to be a sanctuary for healing and honoring this historic truth. And so this is part of the telling of the untold stories, but it's also part of the new partnership of providing a space and a place for this conversation. In addition to the Ramatish Ohlone, um, we are also working with Cafe Ohlone. Um, and this is uh, the Cafe Ohlone um, uh, leaders who uh, put the cafe together, but they also do more than just um, present great food. They came to our property and collected dog bane from our property. Um, dog bane was used to make baskets and, and other um, tribal uh, um, materials. And, um, and there's an existing dog bane patch on our property that we believe was cultivated by the original tribe, tribe that was here in their village site. So it's pretty great to have that continuum. And then climate resilience. Um, this is very important to us being in California. We really have a lot of work to do with lands management. Um, sudden oak death, as you can see, has decimated our forest, which then causes an increased fire load. This is our backyard. This is the mountains literally behind the historic house at Filoli. And, um, and so we are really very uh, aggressively engaging in the discussion of climate action. We have a natural resources management plan so that we can preserve um, the unique ecosystems while revitalizing them um, and making sure that we protect our historic structures. So for us, um, the climate conversation is starting with land in order to protect and preserve um, the, the built landscape as well. And then telling a truer history, um, expanding the stories to tell that truer history. Um, we also have a, a cultural landscape report and this ties to our, our indigenous story, but also the Spanish settlers, the Mexican rancheros, the early American and early California story. We're very much a California story, but this cultural landscape report allowed us to um, really understand our own history uh, so that we're able to um, tell that story better. So we invested in this as part of our master planning process. Um, but probably our, our, greatest, um, our greatest connection with the National Impact Agenda is an engaged public. We have over 400,000 visitors, and we really want to do a better job of storytelling. So the way that we brought it together this year was with an exhibit called Blue Gold, The Power and Privilege of Water. Um, and while the Bay Area was originally financed by gold, um, water is really um, the resource that is most valuable to us right now. And so we did an exhibition um, on this that connects our history to modern climate action. Water has been always been a discussion on the Filoli property from the in, uh, indigenous times. That's why there was a village site here. That's why um, the both the Spanish and Mexicans uh, settled in this area. And, um, and, and so we have that continuum that we can talk about the past, present, and future with the current drought that we're experiencing. Um, it, it gives us that cohesive narrative. And then it allows us to look anew at the stories through our current context, which the lens is a little bit different right now. Um, and it really allowed us to engage in our, vi our visitors' own experience. So we did some visitor interaction. Um, these are little droplets on, an, on a historic mirror, like how can you engage in the water story, take a picture of, of what you can do. Um, we uh, created interactives within the historic house and used the historic house as a storytelling platform. We had interactive spaces, soundscapes, QR codes, and we even um, invited people to come in and take a side on the water, the great water debate. Um, so this is the great debate. We had different uh, newspapers that we created that told the stories from different perspectives, um, from the naturalist perspective of how water came from dammed reservoirs down, um, from uh, Mr. Bourne's perspective, who owns Spring Valley Water Company. So he definitely was interested from the government perspective of how they wanted to monetize and manage and ensure equitable access to water and from the people's side. Um, it, it, at some points um, in the teens and the early teens, um, water would have been um, about $300 a barrel. And, um, and that's a lot of money even in modern times. So imagine 
if that's your only access to water and that's how you had to get it. We also talk about the privilege of water that exists today, existed historically and exists today. In San Francisco, um, housed people have substandard plumbing. And in California, 88,000 people don't have an operating toilet. We don't think about this a lot, um, but, but people live in this kind of um, scenario. And that's just the how, I mean, that's numbers for the housed community. We also have a substantial unhoused community. And, um, and so the access to water and pump plumbing is really a privilege that we take for granted. Um, and what, what did we learn from this? We, we learned that, for, this was an interesting one, 48% of our attendees um, said that the exhibit inspired them to make a change on their own. The remainder said they were already making changes. So, um, so uh, really 100% were, were supportive of the ideas. Um, they felt that this exhibit connected to their own lives, but a whopping 98% felt that it made sense for Filoli to do this exhibition. So this was really aligned with our community need. Um, this also aligns with a study that was just completed by Wilkening Consulting um, in, a, in association with the American Alliance of Museums. If you're not following this, it's a great resource. Um, and you can see here that, you know, no matter where you fall in the spectrum, history museum, historic site, natural history museum, um, a lot of the frequent museum um, goers think that, that climate change and climate action should be a discussion. So our exhibition was both history and climate action and aligned in engaging the public. And similar, uh, similarly, um, they, uh, they think that this is the kind of discussion that should be had. Um, so I think that but, um, I think that this is living sustainably. Um, I think that engaging the public and sustainability are really close allies right now. So important centers of the national impact agenda. Um, so it's uh, it's it was important to get this Wilkening study as I was preparing for for this presentation today. Um, so that concludes my contribution, and I'll turn it over to Hector. Thank you, Cara. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see everyone uh, here. I'm gonna share a little bit of uh, my screen here. Perfect. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Hector Verdecia Hernandez, and I currently lead uh, the Centro de Conservación y Restauración de Puerto Rico, a new nonprofit regional conservation center serving the Caribbean region. In this presentation, I will discuss our recent efforts to create what is now a conservation center for Puerto Rico, including the learned lessons and approaches from this short experience and how they align with the goals settled in the National Impact Agenda. But first, we have to consider that um, the center was funded um, considering specific complex challenges while attempting to solve or at least deal with some, with some of them collaboratively. The first of this set of challenges are the environmental and climate conditions, uh, tropical climate, which is different from uh, the template climates that we use to deal with you know, traditional heritage. Uh, also climate change and that which will be severe for the Caribbean region in the coming decades, but also recent natural disasters, both hurricanes, storms, and earthquakes. All this combined has uh, an impact on our heritage, specifically for the Caribbean region. But also we have to consider the socio-economic context and also that is also linked to the research training and practice. Uh, first, we have to consider that there in Puerto Rico, there's a lack of economic resources for preservation work and cultural institutions. These cultural institutions, museums, um, associations are usually often community, often community based. Um, there's also a lack of update policy tools, uh, lack of technical expertise and personnel. But also we have to consider the political context. Uh, in Puerto Rico, we have language barriers. For example, the majority of the population, we all speak Spanish. So that also prevent us from accessing resources from the US and um, also technical expertise. Uh, 
also uh, awareness of proper management and preservation and uh, with inadequate management, a conservation work or preservation work is too costly or difficult or our projects are driven by last minute decision making processes. Uh, so it's rather than a planned approach. So that is usually uh, difficult for us to develop uh, preservation projects. Also, there is a lack of research. Um, the, a lack of research when I talked about this is more uh, research targeted to our specific tropical complex and specific uh, uh, economic and social context. Existing research often focuses on perspective from disciplines of social and political history and archaeology, but not preservation. But also we have to consider that there are no academic training and professional degree programs in preservation. There are two specific pilot programs, but universities that are dealing with them um, do not have the necessary expertise or uh, economic resources for uh, to promote these programs. Um, and also at last, we have gapping access to information and research papers. Even though we are in our early stages, our projects and current work has been guided by the following lessons and approaches aligning with the goals of the National Impact Agenda Framework. The first approach has been acknowledging and embracing our context, both from a socio-economic and cultural standpoint. We, uh, uh, as one of the main goals for the Conservation Center, uh, the first step was Access, accessing available resources, both technical and financial. But also we ask ourselves, what are the current needs? How we can prioritize them? And lastly, uh, we ask ourselves, what opportunities do we have for our available? Those three questions or these three aspects were key to developing our current project. The lessons learned from that process have led us to think and envision the development of an adaptive approach to advance the preservation field in Puerto Rico through the Conservation Center. This adaptive approach prioritizes a field assessment of needs to guide our decision-making process and foster impactful projects. These projects are based on the needs assessments and relevance. We uh, so. We, we have, I'm going to show today four specific goals within the National Impact Agenda. And um, one of them is climate resilience. Um, different scientific studies point out that climate change disproportionately impacts the global south. For the Caribbean, threats include sea level rise, intense periods of rain and flooding, more intense heat, and humid environment. Nevertheless, the catastrophic effects of natural disasters, such as stronger hurricanes, make our cultural heritage more vulnerable. This climatic phenomena occurs on an annual basis. Our focus as a nonprofit organization is to assist in the recovery efforts and promote the adaptation of historic places to withstand current and future climate impacts. Sencor is currently developing three specific projects directed to assist the recovery process after Hurricane Fiona. One of them is an emergency assessment program for collecting institutions directed to museums, archives, and libraries in partnership with the Puerto Rico Alliance of Museums um, and the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. Additional support has been provided by the American Institute for Conservation. Another uh, project that we are planning is a survey of effective properties in the southwest side of Puerto Rico, an educational and research program for property owners in partnership with Para Naturaleza. There is also a third project that we uh, got funding from National Endowment for Humanities. Uh, it's a climate mapping for cultural heritage project. Uh, the NEH has funded a two-year project to develop a climate mapping tool that can help cultural institutions and individuals prepare for natural disasters in the incoming threat of climate change. The project includes the development of a regional communities of knowledge in the US and Sencor will host the Caribbean Regional Community of Knowledge. And there are other 
in common projects related to climate change in 2023. Our other goal is uh, modernize expanded tools. And we at this conservation center seek to transform any project into an opportunity for building capacity, training and promoting professional development opportunities. This is key to fostering technical expertise for the preservation and management of collections and historic buildings. These initiatives must try to complement academia and research. And also we have to consider that the context pushes us to do more with less. Fostering low cost common sense practice, such as preventive maintenance, using available materials and equipment and evaluating their performance is key to adapt traditional methodologies and practice for Puerto Rico. We have developed several training efforts. One of them was a training project to repair the Senate chamber of the capital of Puerto Rico, which we trained uh, the staff of the capital of Puerto Rico, superintendent's office, and uh, it was uh, focused on a specific restoration and repair works for the ornamental plaster ceilings. Um, these ornamental plaster ceilings were built in 1927, and uh, we trained the staff there. They with no knowledge about preservation, how to repair and to maintain those historic assets. Another project was the architectural salvage project on the sixth floor of the Normandy Hotel in San Juan, a historic hotel from 1940s. We provide training to architecture and fine arts students, and they work as preservation technicians under supervision of preservation professionals. And also there's a third project that uh, is an archeological study for the Segundo Risperdi School in Santurce, where we were able to provide training opportunity for young emerging archeologists. But also, sorry, but also we are focusing on growing collaborative networks. For us, establishing external collaboration with individuals and institutions that can help support initiatives um, is essential. We don't have all the expertise inside, so we need to create relations with professionals who can assist with their expertise on different projects. One of the projects right now that we're working on is a prayer with campaign for historic traits on developing uh, historic traits educational resources for uh, from K to 12 in Spanish. Another project is a heritage stewardship program for paper, book, and photographic collections in Puerto Rico. This is a project in partnership with the Conservation Center for Arts and Historic Artifacts. And we're developing a two-year educational program for staff at cultural institutions for the preservation of paper, books, and photographic collections, which include, includes two internships and several um, professional development workshops. Another project that we work is uh, the Hacienda Enriqueta nomination to the National Register of Historic Places, which was a training opportunity for students, architecture students at the Polytechnic University of Puerto Rico. And we also have a small project uh, in which we host students from the University of Pennsylvania graduate program for preservation. Um, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking to promote research, education, and awareness of preservation in Puerto Rico. And lastly, I wanted to also talk about our strategic outreach and that we have called from heritage to conservation. For one of the goals that we have to do uh, or, or things that we have to do at the beginning was to identify our audience. Um, we find out that our educational content needed to appeal to the public to promote awareness of heritage and how to preserve it. At the same time, we wanted to promote the development of technical content to support the needs of emerging conservators and conservation professionals. This was critical to building a local body of knowledge in the field. Um, we are starting next month a fellowship program that will provide an opportunity for students and emerging professionals to work on small research projects related to the preservation of buildings, sites, and collections. This research will lead to developing online educational content in the Spanish language, targeting both public and professionals. Even though we are in the early phases of the center, we learned that innovation is a synonym for breaking through. 
innovation is disruptive, but innovation is also adaptation and flexibility. As we start small, the center will adapt at its growth as often preservation projects do. The National Impact Agenda Framework is a tool that has helped us to continue developing our current and future initiatives. Thank you. And now I'm gonna pass the next speaker. Hi, I'm Lindsay Darrington. I'm Executive Director of Preservation Austin. So I will take one moment to share my screen. Oops. Thanks. Thanks for your patience. Okay. Okay. So um, again, Lindsay, I'm here in Austin, Texas with Preservation Austin. We're a citywide nonprofit. Oh, I need to actually go to presentation mode. Sorry, guys. Right. All right. I'm sorry, Dee. One second. Stop sharing. Okay, D, I'm sorry. What can, can you see my screen? I'm trying to minimize it so I can also see my notes. So. I can't see your screen anymore. I was seeing it a minute ago. And we also have a backup on our tech side. I believe we can pull up the slides if you need. I am thoroughly confusing myself. So thank you everyone for your patience as I get this all pulled together. No problem. Okay. Right, here we go. Well, all right, I will just wing it without the notes then. Okay. All right, so the work that I'll be sharing with you all today focuses on really four of the seven um, agenda goals from the National Impact Agenda. So an inclusive movement, a true history, equitable communities, and then modernized and expanded tools. A little bit about the city of Austin. Uh, we were just ranked the fourth hottest real estate market in the country, um, what this Emerging Trends in Real Estate 2023 report termed a supernova. So you can imagine how that feels. Um, change is on everyone's mind right now. It is what people are talking about constantly. Um, and it is having you know, a citywide impact on us all. Um, the city's population is really growing, and that's coming with pretty transformational changes. We're rebuilding our highways, we're trying to build a new light rail system, and then all of this is superimposed on what has historically been a very segregated city. Um, local, state, and federal policies have contributed to this development over the past hundred years, starting with our city's 1928 plan that did a lot of you know, positive things in putting a planning document into place for the city, but very tragically also um, created a, a very finite boundary um, through the center of town. So they could not implement racialized zoning at the time and felt like city planners could get around that by creating a Negro district in East Austin, um, thinking, okay, we'll just provide city services for folks who live in this part of town for black families and we'll deny them those services elsewhere. So this is everything from schools to parks um, plumbing, electricity, and so that very quickly shaped this segregated part of town um, where Black families relocated to, to have the same kind of services that the rest of us rely on every day. Uh, Mexican-American families were not outlined in the plan or were not cited or called out in this plan, but um, this had the effect of moving that community into East Austin as well. So you end up with a highly segregated uh, history in this concentrated part of town that holds um, the history of these communities today. And because of you know, years of systemic segregation, um, a lot of redevelopment is now focused on that part of town and displacement and erasure of these communities and their history is a real problem that we're facing. So this is the environment in which we are doing our preservation work today as a citywide nonprofit. It's what we are adapting to and it really makes um, this work of inclusion um, it's not a fad, it's really essential to doing the work that we do. Um, our city is facing some existential 
challenges moving forward. And we really all have to have as many voices at the table if we're going to do this work well and effectively. So a little bit about Preservation Austin. We were established in 1953. So a lot of the work that we're doing involves um, shifting the gears of this very old organization and not necessarily changing what we do, but changing how we do it. We have some wonderful you know, long-term programming that we've been doing for decades. We have a spring homes tour. We do an awards program. We give away matching grants on a biannual basis. And we also do a lot of advocacy. Our mission is that we exist to empower Austinites to shape a more inclusive, resilient, and meaningful community culture through preservation. And we're small. Um, as of this fall, we now have four full-time staff and a budget of about a half million dollars, but that's very new. We started the pandemic with half of those numbers. So two full-time staff and less than a $300,000 budget. So what we're doing is using our resources very carefully to, to affect change. In 2020, we adopted a strategic plan that we're still implementing now. And part of that process involved listening to 25 stakeholders from outside of the organization. Um, and they provided us with a lot of amazing feedback about our work. Um, germane to this discussion was the feedback that we received on diversity and inclusion. And what we heard was that low diversity is a major challenge for Preservation Austin, that there is a definite perception in our community that we currently serve a narrow, affluent, and white audience and people were calling on us to, you know, look at affordability and inclusion and equity in our work. And one of the standout quotes from this, from this feedback was, I believe in the mission, but I think that they have some blind spots um, with compromising and in regards to race. So for us, how do we take that feedback and work to not just change the perception, but change the reality of our organization um, and to really work and pull back on some of these um, challenges that we face internally? So I wanted to start by sharing what we've done with our leadership. Uh, we set a strategic goal of representing Austin's diversity by 2025. And that crosses our board, our committees and our membership, but specifically with our board, um, we looked at our nominating process and decided, okay, let's look at our current demographics on the board and compare it to the best city demographic data that we have, which at the time was from 2017. So we identified gaps and with each nominating cycle works to close those gaps. And over three of these cycles, we've increased um, racial and ethnic representation on our board from 9% to 41% of voting directors. And we've also looked at generational diversity. So in 2020, we had one board member who was born after 1980. For the record, I'm also born after 1980. And then this year, about a third of our board, um, you know, from the millennial generation and younger. And so why is this important? Um, it's essential that we have all voices at the table making decisions about our organization, about how we allocate our resources, about what histories we're celebrating, if we're going to truly do this work well and represent our city. Having a truly diverse board um, increases our credibility. It helps us to better understand the community that we serve. And I think this whole process has shown that you don't have to be, to us anyway, you don't have to be, you know, have one kind of background or be a certain age to bring really invaluable networks and political connections that have empowered our nonprofit to really do some great things. So I'm very excited about where we are. And this really simple, pragmatic, what's our goal? Let's go to meet it has been very effective for us. Another way that we've used data, um, we adopted underrepresented heritage as an advocacy priority in 2020. And we started by looking, okay, well, what's designated? Um, you know, what, what out there is being honored in our city? And so this list that we created did not previously exist. We pulled together, okay, how many city of Austin landmarks honor which underrepresented groups? How many state landmarks? How many you know, national register designations? Pull all this together um, and then saw what you would probably expect, but now we have the information. Only 16% of all designations in the city of Austin honor these communities that have historically not been um, represented within preservation practice. So the Black community, Mexican Americans, um, queer community, women. Um, and as we were looking at this and okay, what do we do with this data next? We had a donor who was like, oh, you're doing this? I'm excited by that. I'd like to give you money to hire two interns to dig into this work further. So in deciding, all right, where did these two interns start? I actually received this gift a week before going on maternity leave, which was such a wonderful send off, but then had to figure out, all right, what do we do with it next? So we started with the Mexican American community and that heritage because we're in central Texas. Um, that 
the Mexican American presence in this city is so important and so infuses our cultural fabric, but um, is one of the least represented among designations. So only 16 city of Austin landmarks out of over 600 speak to this history. So it was an easy place to start for us. Um, the interns gathered over 150 pages of research on 25 historic sites throughout East Austin and some downtown. The public place public facing um, side of this project was putting together a self-guided bike tour in English and Spanish. This was still during COVID, so that was an easy way to get people safely out exploring the city. Um, we collaborated with 16 community members on this project. It was really important that the interns were not just going to libraries and doing, and you know, researching online, but talking to people who have lived this history um, and then providing their research to people who can use this. Something that one advocate told us was, you know, we know what's important in our community, but this is volunteer work for us. We don't do this as a full-time job. We don't have time to go to the library and do all this research. So now we have a lot of that. So if one of these sites is threatened, or if someone wants to access it to write an article, this is for community use. Um, and I want to point out too, you know, there are some beautiful buildings among these 25 sites, but a lot of these sites are legacy businesses and murals that have been restored. And so places that really speak to the city's cultural heritage, not just, you know, capital A architecture. Another way that we have been tackling this work um, is looking at how we can support increasing representation on our city's historic landmark commission. Um, our HLC, we'll call it that, our HLC consistently lacks, lacks representation from key communities. We haven't had a black landmark commissioner since 2014, and at a time when the city's black community is really facing displacement and the loss of a lot of important landmarks, that's a problem that needs addressing. Um, and we have contributed to this system in that council offices that appoint these commissioners often reach out to Preservation Austin and ask us for recommendations. And we typically are thinking, okay, who has a preservation background? And we usually tap our you know, preservation bubble. So people with design backgrounds, preservation professionals, realtors, those fields still tend to be very white. This is not intentional, but this is part of just how we've always done things. And so we looked at, all right, how can we close that gap? And how can we really change this dynamic? Um, and by our solution to that was reaching out to the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions to talk to them about their camp program. Uh, this training is designed for seated landmark commissioners across the country, um, but they were camp and, excuse me, the NEPC were great partners. They were very excited about offering this, not to seated commissioners, but in our case, to people of color who are preservation advocates in the city to help provide them with the really technical skills um, that they would need to serve on the Landmark Commission and to serve successfully. So we actually just had this training in October. Um, so we provided this free commission training to 15 members of the Austin community. Um, our trainers were wonderful, NAPC staff was wonderful. Um, our chair of our Landmark Commission attended, a couple of our staff members attended. This was very affordable for us. It was $1,500 to provide a two topic training covering you know, Secretary of Interior standards, um, certificates of appropriateness, the legal frameworks for the work that the commission does. Um, this was covered for us by a grant um, from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, but it was a wonderful experience. And you know, we had some of the basics that we covered and then people said, how can you even have this training without talking about demolitions? And now we kind of have marching orders for the next round of training. Taking all of this, um, we have elections coming up, you know, all of us do, but we in Austin have city council elections. So we'll have some vacancies on the Landmark Commission starting in January. So my goal is to you know, hope that some of the folks who went through this training will be game to be recommended to city council offices to fill some of those seats. And again, really start to change that dynamic on the commission. Uh, it's really important, not only that we're celebrating diverse histories, but helping people be in decision-making roles. That is, that is crucial to changing how preservation is enacted in this city. Um, my last project I wanna talk about, um, we are really fortunate to have amazing partners in the city of Austin, including their historic preservation office. And they are currently working on an equity-based preservation plan um, to replace our current plan, which dates to 1981. And, 40 years ago, this was a totally different town. So we need new tools and a new approach to looking at how we can broaden preservation and make sure it benefits everyone. So we had two board members from Preservation Austin serve on a working group that helped shape the first phase of this plan. 
I have a staff member who served on this um, working group as well. And then we helped to advocate for funding for its second phase, um, which will really look at community engagement to build a new, more dynamic approach to preservation from the city's perspective. And one of the um, kind of inputs to this plan, which I have to say Dee participated in as one of our experts, um, we partnered with the city of Austin to put together a ULI technical assistance panel. So this is a TAP. Um, what this basically is, is bringing together a mini think tank of experts to tackle a problem. So we were looking at how preservation of historic aged housing can um, lead to affordable solutions because Austin is really suffering a, a severe housing crisis. Um, but the whole preservation versus density, you can't preserve anything is that's going to prevent us from building affordable housing. Um, that dialogue, which dominates a lot of conversations in this city, isn't helpful. So for us as a nonprofit, you know, I'm not an expert in these things. So this was a huge opportunity to bring, you know, D from the National Trust, looking at preservation policy, um, other preservation policy experts, people who work in affordable housing, um, to look at what programs, policies, and tools could we really put into place to make sure that the preservation of single family housing can be one of the solutions to this problem. Um, this report is coming out a little bit later this fall, and I think there'll be a lot in there that other cities can look at as well. Um, how do we reduce fees um, and kind of the background processes that make it easier to demolish than to preserve in this city? How you know, can ADUs and more neighborhood skill density um, create more housing without demolishing neighborhoods wholesale? Um, neighborhood resources, ombudsmen, preparing trust between the city and between people who are trying to stay in their neighborhoods and who are currently being displaced. Um, this whole process not only brought together the panel, but involved interviews with, I think, 40 different stakeholders across the city. So it was really um, a data-informed approach to providing solutions to a problem um, that is, is really weighing on all of us. And for us, we definitely need to have solutions to that problem to be successful. And I think that I had some conclusions, but I know we're at 352, so I will go ahead and, and wrap up my presentation there. It's all I will say is in closing is, um, this has been a lot of change for us as an organization over the past couple of years, and it's really shown me that change is hard and takes time, but I'm really excited about where we're going and hope that some others can adapt some of these ideas to what you all are working on in your own cities and organizations. Amazing, thank you so much to all three of our panelists today. I'm just thrilled with the way that you explored so many different dimensions of not just the national impact agenda, but just the broader issues that are affecting our society as a whole and um, really demonstrating that preservation is occurring, um, not oblivious to these major societal challenges, but directly responding to them in, um, in ways that only preservation can. So that's really inspiring. Um, I want to share some of the questions that have come through the chat in just the last few minutes of the session. Um, and maybe, um, maybe we can kind of start with a, um, a, a broader question here. I'm trying to find it. Um, there are a few questions about research and also community outreach and how that has informed your work. Um, how have, um, how would you say you've approached research that you've conducted in your organizations, um, particularly with, I, I mean, I think one common theme in, in leading change, especially with in the nonprofit sector is doing a, a lot with few resources. Um, could you talk a bit about how you approach research or community outreach, if that's more of, of what you've been focused on? Um, and maybe just have each of you, each of you share a bit about that. Um, maybe Kara, we start with you. Okay, I'll go first. Um, so I, I think that one thing that um, is it was a bit of a challenge we were work, when we were working with the American Alliance of Museums on our equity program, for example, um, is that they were trying to create a new template. Well, that means there isn't one, right? There in, and and also I think that that's what you find a lot with um, equity inclusion, climate action at heritage sites. There's a lot on climate action, but it, it doesn't necessarily directly um, apply. So I think that um, 
I, I, I don't want to say be research less, but I think that there's a lot of extrapolation that has to go into the research. And for us, it went more into the community engagement component um, because it's like, what, what are people really doing? What's really working? What do you really want? And, um, and I think that uh, with a lot of our involvement, um, especially in our program and our and the water story and the climate action that we're taking, we ask a lot of people what they wanted to hear instead of using, um, you know, research that may not be exactly aligned to our own message. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I just attended another conference and, you know, we, we, we forget sometimes is that um, historic sites and heritage sites are often primary sources. So, you know, like, let's continue to be primary sources. I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, and I do want to comment on our evaluation. On our evaluation, we do a combination of internal and external. Um, so once we start our programs, we do um, actually do formal evaluation at, at that point. And then that provides a research basis for others um, to participate in. Thank you. Hector? Yeah, regarding the uh, the research and how we do more with less, um, our approach has been uh, at the beginning is to ask what is already has been done. You know, how, what what's the research that has been done? How we can start thinking, you know, and and developing strategies to put that research out there. How we can uplift people that have done previous research related to preservation or historic buildings, you know, or a specific, you know, art and collections. And that has been our approach. We necessarily doesn't have the resources right now to, you know, to to afford, you know, and, and promote research, but at the but we are um, developing right now an, an initiative, for example, um, a community bibliography for references. How about the university thesis related to heritage, to heritage preservation, historic sites? What about any publication on different journals that are already out there? And we're gathering all that information and put it in one single document. So anyone that are that is interested in 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 think in, in any historic site or any topic related to preservation, they can access that. Um, you know, you know, and from a website. So those are ways that small projects that can have a big impact at the end because that um, is part not only of our mission, but also uh, of the way that we can move forward of the preservation field, so. Thanks so much, Hector. Uh, Lindsay, you covered research and community outreach a bunch, but do you have anything to add? I think using data to affirm or, or disprove assumptions is really important, especially as we're talking about change. And um, one thing that I had in my presentation and took out is we also conducted a membership survey to see who our membership is. And we're using the gaps that we've seen in that survey relative to the city as a whole to do community outreach further. So focus groups with those communities to say, all right, what does preservation mean to you? What does preservation Austin mean to you? And then to try to adapt accordingly. So trying to build out, I mean, data is nothing, but we're so small. It's just, it's not something that we've really looked at before, but it's proving to be really helpful. Yeah, that is so important. You need to establish that baseline understanding through research in order to be able to benchmark any progress that you're making. So I think that's amazing that you prioritize that. All right, we have less than one minute left. I'm just gonna have one more quick question, which is what is a good first step for other organizations who wanna become more inclusive and climate friendly? Anything, anything pop out at you about what helped you take that first step? For me, it was developing the allies um, internally, you know, board, staff, and and then once you have the allies being willing to try things, you know, try try new and different things, know and know that you have a community supporting you. Um, on the same uh, note as Kara, I think for us has been trying to connect with nature conservancy organizations. You know, it's not only within the preservation field, but we have to step forward and start making collaboration cross field. 
And for us, that has been a great experience. They set a goal for where you want to be and make sure you stick to it because sometimes, especially in this realm, people will get cold feet and you have to remind them we have this goal and really use that as your guiding star and never, never veer from it. And that's how you'll get to where you want to go. That to me sounds like the perfect note to end on. Thank you all so much um, for representing your organizations and the leadership cohort so well. And I hope um, everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you for tuning in.